Hey yo, what's up guys? How's everyone doing? Back with another video. Hope you're well. Uh, you'd probably guess why I picked this video to do next, man. A lot of drama happening right now. A lot of stuff going down out in Afghanistan. British involvement, French, German, American involvement. You know, it's a crazy time out there. So I figured now's a good time to... The history of Afghanistan summarised, why not? Bit of a freshen up for us. Um, I've changed the animation style, so I'm obviously down in the corner now. And this is the big screen. I'm, I'm working on getting a bit of a green screen. I think it'd be easier for videos like this, but hopefully you guys can see um, a good portion of the animation without my head getting in the way. But, uh, you know, let's jump in. And uh, if there's any videos like this you want to see, go ahead and let me know. And, uh, you know, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And uh, let's get into it. I'm not even sure what this video is going to look like, like animation-wise. Afghanistan, a nation of 37 million people, has one of the fastest growing populations on the planet and will soon be more populous than either Canada or Poland. It is bordered by Iran, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, China, and Pakistan. Afghanistan is located at the strategic crossroads as connected Iranian, Central, and East Asian civilizations to India. It is one of the most mountainous countries in the world. However, it is also home to a vast network of rivers and fertile valleys, carved out by the massive snowmelt flowing from the Hindu Kush and other mountain ranges which envelop the country. More than 4,000 years ago, the farmers of this region began to urbanize. Little is known about these first ancient city-states, other than that those in the north. Okay, so I'm just looking now like, you know, all you have, all you've ever hear from our troops coming home is how hard it is to traverse the terrain out there. Traverse the terrain. That's a, that's a tongue twister. You know, loads of mountains and the ground that is flat is mined. You know, it's the most mined country in the world if you didn't know that. It must have been a nightmare, man. And like, uh, the, how many documentaries have you seen where like, our soldiers are like struggling to get up the mountains and the Afghans are just up and down it in sandals, no problem. Must have been hard. Oh, what am I referring to? I'm referring to uh, Restrepo. Great documentary if you haven't watched it. Doco slash movie which envelop the country. More than 4,000 years ago, the farmers of this region began to urbanize. Little is known about these first ancient city-states, other than that those in the north, in the land that became known as Bactria, were culturally connected to Central Asian peoples, while those in the southeast were heavily influenced by the Indus Valley civilization, with some of the cities there likely being founded by colonists from the south. However, until more archaeological work is done, Afghanistan's ancient past will remain largely mysterious. Even Kabul, the current capital of Afghanistan, is likely to have been near continuously inhabited for more than 3,500 years, with the exact origin and people who built it unknown. Sometime during the 7th century BC. He's pretty cool that... You know, it's like that, you know, we're coming to a point now in humanity where we kind of think we know everything about everything. And so the fact that there's still large portions of our planet that we just know nothing about. I know it seems obvious to say on the face of it, but when we're talking about cities and we're not even sure who founded them, I find that pretty, pretty interesting. The Medes, a northern Iranian people, were the first to conquer and unite this land under their rule, which lasted approximately a little over a century. They were overthrown by the closely related Achaemenid Persians, who divided the empire up into satrapies, or provinces. By the time of the conquests of Alexander the Great, Persian people, language, culture, and religion were prevalent in what is now Afghanistan, with sizable Buddhist and Greek minorities who the Persians had resettled from their western provinces in the preceding centuries. Alexander faced some of the most formidable resistance of his conquests in Bactria, which is likely the primary reason he married the Bactrian princess Roxana, with whom he had a son, also named Alexander, which secured the allegiance of much of the Bactrian nobility and people, and access to India through- I didn't know that. I did, I did not know that. I knew he married, obviously, but I didn't know the heritage of his wife. That, that, okay, that's interesting. The strategically important Khyber Pass. Alexander also founded several Greek colonies in the region that later became important political, commercial, and military centers. The Macedonian general Seleucus and his descendants ruled over much of the eastern portion of Alexander's empire in the years following his death at the age of 32. Control over Bactria and the Indus River Valley was tenuous at best. Before 300 BC, much of this territory had been lost to the Indian Mauryan Empire of Chandragupta. In the peace that followed the war between... 
we know about Chandra Gupta, obviously. I think we've done a video on him before. Between the two empires, Chandra Gupta married Seleucus' daughter and gifted his father-in-law 500 trained war elephants, which he used to great effect in his wars in the west. Not long after, the Greek cities of Bactria overthrew Seleucid rule, establishing a wealthy kingdom that controlled much of the land trade to and from China and India. They were able to withstand a major Seleucid invasion and a nearly three-year-long siege of their capital city of Balkh, causing the exhausted Seleucids to sue for peace. Over the next two decades, the Seleucid Empire was also greatly weakened by the rise of another one of their former vassals, the Arsacid Parthians. In the southeast, the Mauryan Empire collapsed. The Greco-Bactrians were then able to effectively fill much of the power vacuum left by these two empires, but their success was halted by internal division. You know, isn't it crazy? Like, we're talking about... Uh... An area of a land that I would say is looked over a lot on in history. I know we, in schools we briefly touch on Alexander and I feel like Alexander is one of the most popular figures in history when you talk about his conquests. I understand that. But if we talk about this portion of land specifically, it's mad just to see how intricate the politics gets even on the most barren of lands, like the most mountainous of lands how in the oh no afghanistan currently even if you can class it as a country has one of the most intricate political systems there's clans warlords everything but i just i just find it amazing that every part of our planet at one point has had such conflicts and different political struggles do you know what i'm trying to say like the ones that aren't even popular or we haven't even heard of and how intricate they can be once you start to find out more about them. I think it's brilliant. As much of the army was in India, expanding Greco-Bactrian territory, the king was overthrown by a usurper, splitting the empire into two kingdoms, which both experienced several decades of relative stability and prosperity, and the flourishing of a culture that was a unique amalgamation of Greek, Iranian, Indian, and other Central Asian cultures. After the Greco-Bactrians suffered a series of severe military defeats by the Parthians, they were overrun by successive waves of nomadic invaders. The most powerful of these tribal confederations were the UZ and the Saka, or Scythians, who established control over over the lower Indus Valley. The UZ settled in Bactria and largely assimilated with the local people over time. After the waves of nomadic invasions calmed down to some extent, the Parthians then conquered. And we all know, like, I don't know if any of you play like Rome Total War, just how crazy these nomad horse archers were. Like, they just used to steamroll entire nations. Just armies, just thousands and thousands of horse archers. Um, I was just getting major Rome Total War vibes then, that's all. After the waves of nomadic invasions calmed down to some extent, the Parthians then conquered much of the east, up until the Indus River. The Parthian Arsacid dynasty was very hands-off in their style of governance, and were content as long as taxes were paid and men supplied to the army when needed. And as they became increasingly focused on halting Roman expansion into Mesopotamia, the Parthian noble family that had defeated the Scythians and had seized control over the Indus River, seceded from the empire, establishing the Suren Kingdom, or more commonly called the Indo-Parthian Kingdom. And although they ceased to pay taxes, and their king claimed equal status to the Parthian Great King, the two states appear to have been allies and deeply involved in each other's politics. In the north, the Greco-Bactrian people and Yuzi tribes formed the Kushan Kingdom, and became an empire at the expense of the Parthians, and then expanded deep into Central Asia and the Indian subcontinent. The Kushans worshipped Greek as well as Hindu gods, but gradually over- You know, it's really, it's really easy to over, to underestimate how much the Greeks had an influence on civilization and society as we know it. You know, you, you often picture them obviously having Greece, expanding up into North Macedonia, and then slightly eastward. But when you actually see how far eastward they pushed, and how how much their culture embedded themselves in that society, whether it was in their politics, their culture, their food. It's crazy to see how much of an influence they actually had. Continent. The Kushans worshipped Greek as well as Hindu gods, but gradually over time, Buddhism became more prevalent and was widely promoted within the empire's borders. And even without, 
with Buddhist merchants and missionaries traveling to Han China, which many believe were the first to introduce Buddhism to China. The Kushan Empire was the crossroads of the world. Manufactured goods from as far away as China, Rome, and Aksumite Ethiopia would have been common sites in the great cities of the Kushan Empire. In the west, the Parthians succumbed to internal infighting which allowed the Sassanid Persians to overthrow them, viewing themselves as the re-establishment of the ancient Achaemenid Persian Empire that Alexander had toppled. The reinvigorated Persians successfully campaigned to the north, south, east, and west quickly overrunning the Kushan Empire, and established the Kushan Shahs as vassal kings of a greatly diminished territory, and were gradually stripped of their military and administrative power. During the intermediate period of Sasanian decline, the nomadic Kidarites and then Hephthalites gained control over the eastern portion of the empire. Is it just me, like, while you're watching this and you're seeing the dates pop up, like, 224 to 651 AD, you're trying to picture as well whereabouts your country was at this time? Do you know what I mean? I know it's a little different if you're American. Because, you know, you guys have a young country. But for me, I'm always like, what what, what were we doing at this time? Bathing in our own shit. Right, got ya. No, I'm, jo <laughs> I'm joking. But you know what I mean? Like, it is interesting to think. The Kidarites and then Hephthalites gained control over the eastern portion of the empire. And like the UZ before them, they largely adopted much of the local culture before being reconquered by the Sasanians. It was during Sasanian rule that the first recorded instance of the term Afghan was made in reference to the people inhabiting the mountainous eastern provinces of the empire, and is likely derived from the Pashtun ethnic group which is the largest in Afghanistan. By the time of this region's conquest by the Arab Caliphates, Buddhism and the Persian Zoroastrian faith were the dominant religions in the land that proved difficult to control. Whenever a large Arab army left, the locals would rebel and revert to their ancient customs and self-rule. In the east, Kabul managed to remain in... It's funny because that's basically what we're seeing now. Obviously, we're not an Arab. Arab armies, but Western armies. Like, we tried to bring them under our... Not our control, but... I mean, y you could say that. We're more trying to push out the Taliban, if you want to take the mainstream of opinion on the war in Afghan. And then as soon as we've left, they've reverted back to their old ways either way. Or the Taliban have just went and took control pretty much instantly. And so it, it's weird to see that. It's almost like it's embedded in the DNA in the Afghan people. It's like as soon as you go, it's fingers up and we're going back to what we were doing anyway. Their ancient customs and self-rule. In the East, Kabul managed to remain an independent wealthy city-state controlling trade through the Khyber Pass to India, ruled over by Buddhists and Hindus. It was not until the late 9th century that the Safarid dynasty, founded by a Persian coppersmith born in southwestern Afghanistan, successfully rebelled against the Abbasid Caliphate and firmly established local rule, that Afghans began to convert to Islam which the dynasty widely promoted. The Safarids were overthrown by the Samanid Empire, whose rulers claimed descent from the Sasanian Persians, and extensively promoted Persian culture and Islam throughout the empire. They made the mistake of utilizing Turkic slave soldiers, which in time overthrew them and established the Ghaznavid dynasty. Based out of the city of Ghazna in eastern Afghanistan, they continued the policies of promoting Islam, and Persian culture, particularly among the nomadic Turkic tribes that were settled within the empire. The Ghaznavids were- Okay, so now we're getting to the point where whichever empire comes and goes, their policies and way of ruling is different, but Islam remains the same. So I feel like enough of that and Islam will just become the default religion for the people that live there. Right. Particularly among the nomadic Turkic tribes that were settled within the empire, the Ghaznavids were greatly weakened by conflict with the Seljuk Turk Empire, which allowed for their overthrow by the native Ghurid dynasty, which had recently converted from Buddhism to Islam, and were possibly of Pashtun descent. During the reign of Sultan Giyath al-Din Muhammad, the Ghurid Sultanate became a major world power, stretching from the Iranian plateau to Bengal in the east. However, after Giyath al-Din's death, the empire fell into infighting and was rapidly conquered by both the Delhi Sultanate in India and the Empire of Khorizm, both of Turkic Mamluk origin. Only 15 years after their conquest of the Gurd Sultanate, Khorizm was overrun by the Mongol Empire of Genghis Khan, who frequently- I often do wonder how they know. <coughs> Sorry. And this might be an obvious answer. Like, how did they know the borders ended here specifically without knowing that another nation started here? Do you know what I mean? Is that a stupid question? Unless, like, a highlighted nation, uh, 
territory pops up now and it directly borders here, then you can understand how they come to that conclusion. But without it, I just I usually tend to think like, how did you know that's specifically where it stopped? Or it could just be a guesstimate, I don't know. Frequently massacred the populations of cities that did not immediately surrender. The Mongol Empire split into several successor states not long after their conquest of the region. The Il Khanate, as the name coincidentally implies, fell ill and was ravaged by the plague, wiping out much of the Mongol royal family and army. And as the Il Khanate fragmented into many small states, the Tajik vassal princes of Herat established a sizable kingdom for a short time. All of these small states were conquered by the Turco-Mongol warlord Tamerlane, who inflicted even greater slaughter and destruction throughout the Near East than the Mongols had done a few generations before. Timur frequently used Afghanistan as his base of operations, and his descendants moved the capital from Samarkand to Herat. The century following Timur's death began with peace and prosperity and ended with internal strife and civil war. With its territory being lost to the Uzbeks in the north, okay. the Safavid Persians... It's nice every now and again you have like a name pop up, like the name of an empire or civilization that you're familiar with. I feel like the Timurids are like one of the more well-known clans, tribes, people of this time. Do you know what I mean? War. With its territory being lost to the Uzbeks in the north, the Safavid Persians in the west, and in the southeast, the emergent Mughal Empire, which would go on to conquer most of India, claiming descent from Timur and Genghis Khan. Throughout the 17th century, Afghanistan became a largely autonomous buffer zone between the powerful Safavid and Mughal empires. In 1709, the Pashtun Hotek dynasty successfully rebelled and established a short-lived empire by conquering a great deal of Iranian territory. The Safavid Empire it was over- been constant throughout the whole of their history, hasn't it? It has been non-stop. I know there's like 100 years here and there just in between. So for like a, a person growing up, one generation, you would never know anything different than the current clan that controlled the region. But when you look at it over the grand scheme of things, like it has been constant. I'd say more so than much else in the world. Like Europe had already pretty much been established for like, since after the Romans left, I feel like the territories changed a bit here and there but largely just started to become themselves england become england france become france was frankier um scandinavia was largely just nomads i suppose when you when you take a specific region then i can see like how it can be done with the shift in tribes and clans overthrown by the soldier of fortune nader shah he was the son of a common herdsman and one of the most brilliant military strategists ever to have lived. He reconquered Afghanistan and defeated Ottoman and Mughal armies, but his reign was brought short when he was assassinated at the age of 48. One of his cavalry commanders, Ahmed Shah Durrani, was a Pashtun and returned to his homeland, where a Pashtun tribal confederation selected him as their leader. He used his military experience to great effect, conquering those cities that did not join his cause in Afghanistan. And during his long 25-year reign, he successfully campaigned in India three times against the Marathas and Mughals, and even sacked their capital city of Delhi in 1757. The Durrani Empire is considered the foundation of the modern state of Afghanistan, and Ahmed Shah Durrani as the father of the nation. The empire declined after okay, they were I defeated. I feel like this is where it's really going to get like, I don't want to say relevant because I've enjoyed the whole thing, but I mean like, we can grasp more of an understanding on Afghanistan, how it is today by the Sikhs and driven out of the Indian subcontinent. However, the greatest factor influencing their decline may have been economic, as trade was cut off to China due to poor diplomatic relations and the traffic along the ancient land trade routes connecting India, Iran, and Central Asia all but disappeared. This was due to the expansion of the Russian Empire into Central Asia and the dominance of the British East India Company over maritime trade, leaving Afghanistan in a more isolated state than it had been in in over 2,000 years. But also a more unified one, with the majority of the country practicing the same religion, Sunni Islam, and the concept of a national Afghan identity became prevalent, regardless of tribal or ethnic affiliation. The Durrani were overthrown by Dost Mohammad Khan, who established the Emirate of Afghanistan, the British, who had largely gained control over India and its revenue, feared that the Russians would take Afghanistan and use it as a staging ground to take India from them. So to preempt the Russians, they invaded instead and reinstalled the deposed Durrani king on the throne, who was widely disliked. After encountering minimal resistance to their conquest and occupation of the country, 
the British withdrew most of their troops back to India. The remain I've got to be completely honest. I didn't know we was ever in Afghanistan before this. I would have assumed we passed through, obviously, having trade in the region, the East India Trade Company. I, I get that. But I never knew we had troops placed there. That's, that's very interesting. The remaining British occupying force was then ambushed and was almost completely slaughtered as they attempted to retreat from the country. In a event that shocked Great Britain and the Western world, the Afghans then reinstated Dost Muhammad Khan on the throne of the country. Nearly four decades after the first invasion, the British invaded again. A peace was concluded after both sides suffered heavy casualties. Afghanistan became a British protectorate, with the Afghans maintaining complete self-rule and the British handling their foreign affairs, which they didn't do too much of anyways. Namely, no cadoodling with the Ruskies. 40 years later, in a third Anglo-Afghan war, 120,000 Afghans invaded India. After a few brief clashes with the British, a treaty was made where Afghanistan would be internationally recognized as a fully independent state. A few years later in 1926, the country was reformed into the Kingdom of Afghanistan and began the process of modernization and increased contacts with the outside world. In 1973, the monarchy was overthrown in a bloodless coup d'etat by the king's cousin, Mohammed Daoud Khan, who became the president of a single party republic, who further sought to modernize the country and received aid from the Soviet Union and the United States who both tried to curry influence over the country. In 1978, Daoud and many of his family members were assassinated during a communist coup d'etat, establishing the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan. This Soviet-backed government pushed wide-ranging reforms that sought to modernize and abolish most traditional and religious societal structures. This caused widespread insurrection and- Okay, so this is like in the heart of the Cold War. Communists have rolled in, they're trying to stamp out religion, stuff like that. <laughs> You ever told, have you ever told a Muslim people that you can't be religious? <laughs> you know, in hindsight, it really doesn't go down that well. Most traditional and religious societal structures. This caused widespread insurrection and Soviet involvement in a long war of attrition that nearly lasted 10 years and caused millions of refugees to leave the country. A few years after the Soviet Union withdrew their forces, the Islamic State of Afghanistan overthrew the government and took over the cities, which was largely overthrown by the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan in 1996, which established a totalitarian rule. They were removed from power five years later by U.S. coalition forces and the Northern Alliance, and established the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan in 2004. Let me know in the comments of what you believe the future holds for Afghanistan. Also, let me know in the comments. Oh, okay, so I thought it was going to go a bit more in depth. When was this video released? 2019. Yeah, I thought you would have went a bit a bit further up in time. Maybe not. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know what's funny though? Someone just said type in America in Afghanistan and you'll find the video because he couldn't remember what the name of it was. And I was like, yeah, sure, sounds good. Sure enough, there it was, top of the pile. <laughs> not one American was mentioned in this video as well, which is just great. It's like, oh well, a few of them were. I saw, saw a picture of Kennedy. Um, stop. <laughs> Did you guys just see my search bar then? Go back and pause it. Yeah, I'll show you. <laughs> it's just such a random search bar. Oh, wow. Um, search history, sorry. Okay. So I'm trying to get to grips at the minute. This is this the reason I watched the video in the first place. Right. You try and find a video on YouTube at the minute. That's like been updated in the past week or so about Afghanistan that isn't from like a, a mainstream media outlet I just don't want to see it from the mainstream media man because I just don't know how, I'm so skeptical about how much of the information that we're getting about Afghanistan is true at the minute I don't know why there would be a reason to lie but you know you know what the media is like man I just don't trust it will there be reforms in Afghanistan there's talk to them joining the international community, which I just think is absolutely insane. Do you know what I mean? Like, are we actually having this conversation? But then you also get the viewpoints of, well, why not? They're their own people. They can dictate what they want to do. It's just a very moral... It's a moral dilemma. Do you let a people take control that you know are going to cut off the heads of women and children? Do you know what I mean? Does the West get involved? I feel like whenever the West gets involved, it, it's more trouble than it's worth. We end up making things worse. But, but at the same time, there's people protesting here in the UK saying, go help Afghanistan, we need military intervention. 
But it was probably these same people 10 years ago that was like, get out of Afghanistan. It's such a confusing time. Um, sorry, just go ahead and... Um, it's such a confusing time and I don't really know what the UK is going to do. What I know a lot of my subscribers are American. What are your views on how America has handled the situation? I know Biden has come under a lot of criticism at the minute. Um... Although I did see some heartwarming thing on, I think it was Instagram, so it might be bollocks, who knows. But it was a video of two British soldiers. No, it was four British soldiers helping two American citizens out of this building. Not helping them out, it was just kind of escorting them. There was no real emergency there. But uh, I didn't realise America was, and don't quote me on this because I might be wrong. So America have a perimeter at Kabul Airport and they're refusing to leave it to go out and find their citizens because well I think it's just Biden's orders so British troops have started bringing back some American citizens for them which I thought was like a really heartwarming thing to do I saw the French brought back some British citizens which I thought was cool I don't know I, th I just thought it was nice seeing different countries kind of help each other in that way um, but let me let me know what you guys think what's your take on it what's Biden's handling the situation how do you think the British have handled it and what are your views on where we stand on the Taliban? I'm just hearing so many different opinions. In a weird way, if you go on social media, which is never a good thing to do in the first place, and you look down like TikTok videos, Instagram videos, I almost get the sense that the Taliban aren't being viewed as the... Not, I don't want to say they're not being viewed as the bad guys. But in a weird way, they've sort of been romanticised a little bit as freedom fighters or and the West has been villainised. And maybe that's right. I don't know. But I just want to get your guys' take on it. Um, you know, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, I sometimes feel like I talk too long at the end of the video, but it is what it is, man. It's just what I do. Um, but yeah, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff, guys. And peace out. I'll see you soon. Let me know what you want to see in the comments. Peace.